Welcome back to Seek Strength and welcome back to Seekistan. Today's video, we're going to be talking about whether you should be a low bar or a high bar squatter, no matter if you're a powerlifter, a weightlifter, or an athlete, general strength training person. This video, we're going to go through the different types of options available for, for you and the pros and cons of each of those so you can make an informed decision. Now, when it comes to high bar and low bar, there's a couple of different options available, a couple of different subsections of these where there is significant variations in technique that depend on someone's kind of body type and preferences. And through the years of coaching and lifting ourselves, we've kind of narrowed these down to a particular set of options that we really like coaching and we find work very, very effectively for pretty much everyone so far that we've encountered. So these are a couple of different options. Uh, they're relatively straightforward and mostly, again, depends on the limb leverages of the athlete more than anything else. So when it comes to low bar, we have two options that we really like doing most consistently, and it's the ones that we find ourselves applying to most athletes. The first option is this predominantly toes forward low bar position. Now, when it comes to the low bar, we're generally talking somewhere between the AC joint and a little bit lower. We're very definitive in having an actual minimum and maximum range of low bar. It's not so low or get as low as possible that you can no longer barely support the barbell. We still like to be approximately level with that AC joint or a bar's width lower. So this yeah. first option, toes forward, quad dominant. Yeah, the big thing with that uh, bar depth or how low that bar is on your back, I think a lot of the time people get a bit caught up in that kind of race to the bottom. You want to get it lower and lower and lower and they'll sacrifice certain things like upper back posture, upper back strength, maybe their wrist position will be sacrificed, maybe their elbow position will be sacrificed. And as Owen was saying, it really isn't a thing of just trying to get the bar as low as possible or trying to get it as low as possible within the rules. You really do need to find that kind of perfect spot for how mobile you are at the moment, how long your forearm is compared to your upper arm, how, uh, how ready your upper back is to accept that load. The good example of this is Rondell Hunt, who is a very, very strong low bar squatter who uses a very toes forward, knees forward dominant style squat. And this is a style of low bar that we use with, I'm gonna say over half of our lifters who are low bar squatting, whether that powerlifting or otherwise. And this is one that allows that kind of high bar positions with a low bar. And it seems to be the most productive for the vast majority of body types. Yeah, I definitely refer to this as the kind of contemporary low bar squat or the, the more modern of the low bar squats. Much better balance between anterior and posterior, much better use of the quads in almost all cases, even in lifters who might have relatively weak legs. Yeah, it's the uh, renaissance squat, you might call it. Second option then is a variation or a subsection of this toes forward squat. Someone like Russell Orhi or Russ Swole on Instagram is a good example of someone who is slightly wider than shoulder width, still uses a quad dominant squat, but opens up their hips and their knees to allow them to sit in between their feet, to allow that consistent back angle, but also allow them to hit depth in a, not a cheating fashion, a, a more efficient fashion is probably a good way of phrasing that. And it makes perfect sense. If you're a power lifter trying to get below parallel, this idea that some lifters might be more suited to kind of opening the hips, opening the knees out, not fully vertical shin we're still driving our knees forward but at the same time we're opening those to allow us to sit in between our hips and not have as much forward knee travel and not get as much absolute depth depth i think there's an important point here as well is that like not all low bar squats are created equal and what owens outlined here in those two models definitely seem to be a hell of a lot more advantageous than kind of two different style of low bar squats so the first one um, which many of you will be familiar with will be that kind of old style west side barbell squat the the kind of barbell squat that came over from geared powerlifting where we get super wide stances we really see lifters sitting back into a squat position uh very very vertical shins this has almost no quad development almost no quad recruitment and you just see basically this this style coming from trying to load up that suit as much as you possibly can stretching that suit as much as you can stretching out all the material that's in the back of the suit making that load up with as much elastic potential as possible that obviously doesn't happen when our torso is more upright because if you imagine the kind of ass of my pants if i sit very very upright and i'm wearing dungaree style uh 
pants mm. then if i sit super upright i don't get much tension if i start to lean forward i get more and more tension coming through the straps of those in they're in storing more kind of potential energy um another side of squat which is slightly more rare is that super narrow stance knees yep. almost touching you see a lot more kind of female uh, athletes using this i really don't like this this kind of goes too far in the other direction but there's horses for courses and reasons for everything yeah but those last two options are ones that we would essentially never coach and have, have yet to implement i won't say never say never and maybe there might come a day where someone might have to use that where we're going to use it with them but so far that has never been the better option of compared to the other two to be honest, every time I've come across someone who squats like that, I've had to coach them out of that. Mm -hmm. Now, next up, we've got the particular styles of high bar squatting. And if you've watched our squat technique series, you'll be probably pretty familiar with all of these, including the low bar styles that we've gone over. But kind of a refresher or a simplified manner for the high bar squat, of course, is something just above that AC joint that we're looking maybe in line with the clavicle somewhere along here, just a little bit above the AC joint, but we're still on a very wide part of the shoulder. We're not, not the Ragan Gabriel, we're not in a Gabriel sink rein style position where you're not sure if he's actually just front squatting the bar. That style of high bar squat isn't something we like to do, but it's generally just that kind of a nice happy medium where we're still able to keep a very upright torso. So there's two different ways lifters can and do go about this effectively. One, we have the style of squat where we might see with Lord Anatoma from Romania, where it's aggressively toes forward, very, very, very quad dominant. And you'll see a lot of elite weightlifters have this style of squat uh, where they're favoring the knee extensors as much as possible, very upright torso, sitting as low as possible while keeping that upright torso. And this is one where it is very, very useful if you can do that style of squat but isn't always an option. Yeah, and I think that's the, the real crux of this is you're probably looking at one of the most effective training tools you can use here. For many, many people, it's going to be a long road to be able to initially just hit that position. But for many people, depending on leg length or uh, relative range of motion in your ankles, if you have previous injuries in your ankles, you might be years getting to this position if you ever end up getting there. Yeah, like if you look at this compared to the second style of squat, which is slightly toes out, although the first option can have toes out as well, where we have a more even distribution between the hips and the knees. So sometimes you'll see coaches coaching the squat and they'll say break with your knees first, or more commonly, break with your hips first. A better way of looking at this, though, is someone like Nino Pizzolatto, who squats both with their ass and quads in a nice even distribution. And this is generally for someone who isn't quite built with maybe that Tian Tao style proportions or lose our zone where your back is very long and your legs are very short and that is something that doesn't always appear for most people that's not the most common body type so this style of hips going back as knees travel forward gives us this option to load up the lower body still a lot of knee extensors but allows us to circumnavigate some of the less common genetic favorabilities like extreme ankle range of motion while still keeping an upright torso think what you get in that second style squat, uh, that kind of more hybridized style of squat, what you get as well is positions that become much more applicable to sports other than just weightlifting. So obviously weightlifting, massive strength and power sport, incredibly quad dominant. When you start looking at like field sports, maybe some throwing, maybe some track and field, the development of the kind of posterior chain, the ass, the hammies, the back, Getting that small bit more posterior chain into your squat is definitely not a bad thing. You know, what's really interesting is if you look at Team Italy and a lot of the female lifters squat like that, and a couple of the Bulgarians I've seen squatting like that, the Bosa there, the 7381 kilo lifter, there's a video of squatting 280 just this week as the world's run, and he, a couple of people are even commenting on Instagram, like, the depth, you'd not even know hidden depth. Like, shut up. But anyway, you can see that he's very purposely not squatting as low as possible he's incredibly well developed back and ass but still can block snatch 170 as fast as possible so it's not always cut and dry which brings us to the next part what one should you be doing what's up first fits so in my opinion you need to look at your own particular situation first and that's just in terms of what sport you're doing what your lifestyle is what your kind of relative morphology and your relative range of motions are. And that's 
that's the kind of main crux of this. Obviously, certain people are going to be powerlifters and the max weight is going to be the main thing. But for all of us else who aren't powerlifters competing in competition or just maxing out in the gym, we really need to look at what can I do right now and what's a realistic place for me to get to. So if you are built like Zach Talander, mm-hmm. our friend, the friendly giraffe, uh, and you've incredibly long legs, you mightn't have the best ankle range of motion, even though Zach does have quite good ankle range of motion. In that case, it's going to be very difficult if you're going to try and squat like Toma. So in that case, toes super far forward, we're very, very taxing on our ankle mobility. Also, if the distance between our knee and our hip is very long, it means that displacement is going to be very, very big. Our ass will really have to come back. And then it's going to be very difficult to keep an upright torso. And that really is the kind of crux of the relationship here. If we can't get the knees far enough forward and our hips have to go very far back because we have long legs, then maybe standing with that slightly wider or slightly more toes out stance is going to be favorable. So in that position, we would be looking at more of a low bar squat, which kind of brings us on to the second point. So if you are someone who's not really well built for high bar squatting or you're, you know, you've know, you got those leverages that aren't the most favorable, you can aim for that low bar position. But being low bar doesn't necessarily mean that we're always cutting depth. So you can get quite deep with a low bar position. And just as we're using Zach an example, you can see he went through a phase of squatting as deep as possible, much deeper than he ever had trained before, like literally ass to grass kind of squat where you're sitting as low as he possibly can. So that doesn't necessarily negate the need for cutting your depth or squatting kind of just below parallel. The use of the low bar still can be done with deep squats where we do, for example, have that toes forward position, use a lot of knee extensors, but also use our ass a lot. Yeah, and I think that the full range of motion is so, so valuable when you're looking at general athletic development, general injury prevention. If you're a rugby player or a grappler or someone like this who's going to be coming into impacts or maybe you're a soccer player and you're going to have these kind of really awkward falls or tackles, you doing full range of motion squats is going to be the best preventative for these kind of catastrophic injuries. The ability for your your joints, your muscles, your tendons, your ligaments to go through full that full range of motion, to control your body weight through that full range of motion is just going to be so, so valuable. And that is, a lot of us will prioritize the high bar, the super upright position, but maybe you're doing your high bar and not really able to bottom out those squats, not really able to get your full range of motion. And in that case, high bar is a great solution. So... One thing for low bar is if you need to move maximum weight, if your goal is to lift the most possible weight and your definition for a squat is just below parallel, the use of the low bar is essentially a no-brainer. Uh, it's, you know, whether that's in competition or in the gym, if you want to move the most weight, regardless of its potential carryover to sports or other aspects of your life, the low bar is the better option. And that's why pretty much all of the best and heaviest squats and powerlifting are done with low bar, with the exception for nobody knows why with John Hack. He squats high bar. He says he really likes it, said he doesn't like low bar, doesn't feel as good for him. He's just a freak of nature, and we shouldn't even consider him in this conversation. For everyone else, 99% of elite powerlifters squat low bar. So the best option, if you want to move the maximum amount of weight to a below parallel squat, low bar is a no-brainer. It's definitely the better option. And there's not a whole lot more to say about that one in the fact that if that's your goal, low bar is the one. And it's, the one. it's don't even waste your time. I, Sorry. I think then moving on, when we look at people who are looking for that athletic development, maybe you're an athlete, maybe you're just someone who likes bodybuilding, but you like feeling athletic, the high bar squat really becomes the main tool. It becomes the better option. It's much more similar to the positions we hit when we're jumping, bounding, landing, rebounding. All these positions, your high bar squat, although won't be the exact stance you're going to use, it will much more similarly, much more appropriately emulate the positions we're going to hit when sprinting, jumping, tackling and having all these positions. The, The joint angles tend to be more similar. Very, very rarely will we go into an impact where we are in that super inclined torso position. We might be, our torso might be at the same angle in comparison to the ground or the horizon line, but our hips and our knee angles will be much more similar to a high bar back squat position. 
So for the vast majority of people who are looking to do strength training for their sport, most, if not, I'm going to say 90 yeah. 8%, like a very small percentage, do low bar. The vast majority of them actually will squat high bar. And that includes people like our rugby players who are going to be probably larger in stature. Uh, athletics people who might be a little more limmy will still squat high bar. Even if it's not to that rock bottom depth, you're still getting more range of motion through that lower body. We're getting the explosion of the tendons. We're training the stretch starting reflex a little bit better than you would with the low bar. And you're getting that full range of motion, which hopefully will prepare us for particular aspects of collisions or change of direction aspects. So when you think about change of direction, it's essentially how much force can you apply in the opposite direction to break yourself, reverse that direction and change. You're thinking of soccer, rugby, football, whatever it is. If you need to go this way, if you're going fast in this way and you need to turn around, the stronger you are, specifically in the lower limbs, the better you're able to change that direction. And there's a lot of good evidence with that, but it also makes some logical sense when you think about it. So that high bar squat just features very, very heavily in pretty much all of our athletes. Now, if we had a six foot seven NBA player, would we be high bar squatting with them? The answer is unlikely. It's not out of the question, but it would be a little bit more of a particular kind of nuance in that scenario. Yeah, I think the the last thing we have to talk about with athletes, um, and athletes who are training a lot in, in their specific sport, a lot of what we hear is people will say, oh, the squats really make my knee sore. And this is, genuinely a very very valid concern for a lot of people uh, it might be that your knees get particularly torqued during your sport maybe it's a grappling sport where people's knees are getting twisted around or maybe it's a sport like weightlifting where the snatch and clean and jerk the specific movements of the sport put big stress on our knees uh, similar enough to marathon running or long distance running the knees tend to be inflamed a lot of the time a lot of time we then say our athletes will incorrectly say I'm not going to squat, I'm going to take all load away from my knees, not squat, not induce any additional inflammation, and they view that as the kind of the best option. I, my knees are already inflamed, I'm not going to do anything to them, and they'll be better because of that. Uh, I would actually put a counter into that, that the use of the squat in order to develop the tendons, the ligaments, the cartilaginous tissue around our joints is absolutely vital to make sure those knees don't become overly inflamed and your your initial onboarding will be quite difficult it will take quite a lot of uh, regulation with you and your coach making sure we're not massively inflaming the knees when we bring in the squat the first time you start doing it and you'll have to be very very conscious of loading and volume for the squat but in the long run and i'm talking about only around a month or two of that kind of onboarding process in the long run, you are going to have far, far healthier knees. You're going to have far more healthy tissues around the knees and those kind of problems that are, are symptomatic of having sore knees. So incredibly tight quads, incredibly tight hamstrings, possibly uh, some variables in the, the tracking of the patella, although maybe not. But those different aspects that lead to that inflammation of the knee will be massively helped by having stronger and more kind of squat prowess. The last section or last two sections for the case for the high bar squat is if you are looking for just general living, if you're looking to use the squat as a reason to be strong for life, for older age, that full range of motion is just going to be more useful. The greater mobility demands, which is something that is severely lacking in a lot of populations. Uh, one of the tests they'll do in elderly populations is things like the sit and reach, uh, getting up off the ground, all of these are massively helped by your ability if you can high bar squat and they are very common tests. They might feel very simple to you now and a lot of the age demographic watching this will be like, so it's super easy to get off the ground. But if you haven't spent a lifetime squatting double body weight high bar, when you get to your older age, the option is going to be very, very difficult. And the low bar squat, while it would be much greater than no squatting at all that full depth high bar squat with full range of motion is going to be just further in that useful direction where we are extending and stretching those ligaments and muscles tissues and exposing those joints to full range of motion as close to the ground as possible it is just going to prepare us a lot more for general living and later in life which i know is something that quite a few people watching this actually do think about yeah 100 percent on an interesting point 
the number one reduction in movement that puts people in nursing homes or in care facilities in the, the United States, people oftentimes think about, oh, it's the inability to walk or something like that, that as people get older, but it's actually rotation of the lower trunk um, because obviously you can't turn around and wipe your own ass, which is something obviously none of us in our earlier lives are going to be thinking about, but certainly having a healthier squat is going to be massively helpful then. Um, and I think particularly for, for those of us who are desk bound or maybe you're sitting in a car or you travel a lot and you get that shortening of those hip flexors, definitely the full range of motion of the high bar back squat is going to be so, so beneficial. A lot of times what happens is someone will fall and they'll break a limb. They will break their hip, something similar, a tibia, a fibia. And generally then they'll go into hospital and often pick up an infectious disease or head on a downward spiral because they didn't have the bone structure and the resilient tissues to either prevent that from ever happening or the ability and capacity then to recover from that faster. So high bar squat would get the, uh, the positives in the realm of general living. Now the last thing is high bar squat's just cooler and as subjective it is much more aesthetic it's much more pretty to look at. It's a much nicer lift pretty to watch. Pretty boy with your squats. Like if you look at, for example, the extreme example, I know I picked them a lot, but I'm just using them as an example, is the current couple of French powerlifters. Some of them have a very, very unesthetic squat, whereas that f full range of motion, the sitting down as low as possible in the high bar squat is just cooler. And a lot of people care about that. And for example, Look, right now, maybe I could load up a low bar squat, low parallel and squat, like, in a couple of weeks, squat like 315 or 320, but I have absolutely no interest in that. It is just objectively less cool. Nah, it's just not the same, like, it's just not as cool. If you'd like more information, we have a Seeker Strength Squat Masterclass available. It's on the Teachable platform, technical models, programming, general ranges of motion and your flexibility needed the cues and how to cue someone for the squat there's massive amounts of information in there for the squat if you want that click on the link below and it's available to view there if you need a squat program head over to the seekstrength.com Wrote down your squat program eight weeks in length it is tough but it will get you some pretty significant pbs if you give it your all for those eight weeks